So for the people who um, haven't seen the latest uh, schedule yet, or the um, next talks will be by... First of all, there is a talk at uh, Miso today at 13 o'clock by Larry Dickens about um, marine hy gas hydrates. Uh, and then Milena will talk here at 3 o'clock. And then we have... On Wednesday, nothing in the morning, but we have uh, Yanni talking at 14.30. And then we have uh, Niels speaking yes, uh, on, when, on Thursday then at 10.30. And Michael Gill on Friday at 10.30. <coughs> That's the plan. And it should be on the, on the web, of course, in due course. So it's a pleasure to welcome Joni Vestenen today. Uh, he did his PhD in 98 at the University of Helsinki. He um, has then been here at uh, North Shopping at the Rossby Center for five years and then became associate professor at the University of Helsinki. He has been mostly working on analytical um, models and uh, intermodal inter uh, time comparisons. So it's a pleasure to hear him today speaking about uncertainties in projections of climate change. Okay, so, so th thank you for this introduction and thanks for this opportunity to give this talk here. So, so the uh, title is Uncertainties in Projects of Climate Change. And as the first slides indicate, this is actually a recycled talk. I basically gave the same presentation in a climate impact related workshop in North Shopping in October last year. But hopefully the, the audience here is today is completely different. So this, this should not matter. So, why cannot we predict future climate exactly? Well, there are at least three different group of, group of uncertainties. First one is associated with the inability to, to be, uh, predict the future behavior of mankind on those aspects that are relevant for future climate, particularly in emissions of greenhouse gases and aerosols, but all, of course all those other factors like changes and land, land use and so on. Then we have uncertain modeling of the resulting anthropogenic climate change. First of all, uncertainty in converting the emissions of greenhouse gases and aerosols to atmospheric concentrations that are actually relevant for the radiative forcing to which the climate reacts. And then, of course, the answer is in the physical climate system, how it responds to these changes in atmospheric composition. And third, we have natural climate variability, which is partly caused by variations in solar activity and volcanic activity, but also a lot of internal variability generated by the normal and linear dynamics of the climate system, even when all these external forcing are, are constant. So, how important are these different sources of uncertainty? One of the factors that this depends on is, of course, the time range of the projections. This semantic diagram, the left-hand side, shows the evolution of some climate indicator, for example, a temperature at some location up to the present, and the right hand side shows the possible evolution during the rest of the sense. So, in the beginning, the uncertainty is basically dominated by natural variability, but when you go further to the future, the uncertainty is associated with modeling and emission scenarios both increase. The modeling uncertainty basically increases because it is in some way proportional to the magnitude of the change in the external forcing and the change in the external forcing is assumed to increase because the greenhouse gas concentrations will continue to increase. Scenario uncertainty seems to be small in the short run. These different scenarios diverge relatively slowly from each other and of course the atmospheric composition actually reacts with the time lag to changes in the emissions but towards the end of the century 
this uncertainty also is, is probably quite, quite important. Yoni, I, I would draw that picture differently, I think. The, okay. um, I mean, if we look at the, the difference between the, the measured components of climate and model output at this stage, there are at least three contributions to that difference. There is the natural variability of the, of the system, there is the internal variability of the climate model, which is not the same thing, and there is the errors, structural uncertainties in the model itself. And all three of those things contribute right now to the distinction between what the model is saying right, and what the climate system is actually doing. So I think in your diagram, models need to go right back into the observational period, model uncertainty. Okay, so yes, I'm by, by, bypassing this here. So. Okay, so, well, perhaps it's better, it's better not, to not discuss this too much in detail yet. This is not really, uh, really, really any further. So, what will happen in the rest of the talk? So, it is basically divided to three parts, and the first part, two parts, are basically an attempt to give some numbers to this previous diagram. So, I'm trying to quantify this different sources of uncertainty based on the variation of available global climate model results. The third part is at, at actually slightly, slightly different. Here I am asking what is actually meant by present day temperature climate and how it, how it should be estimated. So, of course, this presentation is very much based on model results. So there is a caveat. The uncertainty in the real world might be larger than this model results surface. First of all, because the range of emission scenarios that has been considered in these simulations, it may not cover all possibilities in the real world. Second, we know for sure that these models are not completely independent, so they may might not be different enough to cover all of this modeling uncertainty. And finally, there are some components of modeling uncertainty and forcing uncertainty that are not actually considered in this existing simulations. So, in the first part, I, for the moment, neglect this scenario uncertainty and just focus on climate change or under one particular emission scenario, the so-called A1B scenario, which is one of these SREX scenarios that has been quite widely used in climate change research during the last decade or so. So, in terms of carbon dioxide emissions, SS A1B, it's more like all of these other scenarios, it shows an increase during the next 30 or 40 years, just because the global population is increasing, the global economy is, is, is growing, both these factors tend to increase the demand for fossil fuel based energy. Later there is a slight decrease in emissions due to more environmentally friendly technology, but nevertheless for this particular scenario, even in, in the end of the century emissions would be slightly above the present day level. So what is the best estimate of the resulting carbon dioxide concentration is shown here. So in the end of the century, we would end up somewhere slightly over 700 parts per million. Has been presented around about 390. So now two questions about this that I'll be addressing. First of all, how well do these different climate models actually agree with each other on simulated climate change? And second, how much of these differences in climate change between these models can actually be explained by simulated internal variability rather than being directly associated with these differences in, in modern dynamics and physics? This analysis is based on the so-called semi-free data set where we have for this A1B scenario, a total of 51 simulations for 22 different global climate models. So for many of these models, there is more than one realization available. So these models have been run with the same forcing, but with different initial conditions to generate different realizations of internal variability. What should be noticed is that in this set of simulations, the greenhouse gas concentrations are prescribed. So the carbon cycle uncertainty that is, how large a part of these anthropogenic emissions actually remain in the atmosphere, that is not included. 
and also for the 21st century there is no variation, variation in solar and volcanic activity. So, let's begin from a very basic indicator of climate change, that is the 30-year change in the long term or 30-year mean annual mean temperature between the late 20th century and late 21st century. Well, the first map shows the multimodal mean change in decrease centigrade and, well, to most of us, many of us, this is a very familiar pattern. So, basically, more warming over land than, than ocean areas, with the exception of the Arctic Ocean, where here we have this decrease in sea ice, which very strongly amplifies the global warming, particularly in autumn and winter. The second map shows the standard deviation between the simulations. So, first of all, we can note that the numeric values are generally much lower than they are for the mean says. So, in this sense, the agreement between the simulations is actually not, not that bad at all. But even the standard deviation is geographically variable, so it's relatively low in, in over tropical oceans. And similarly with the, with the mean warming, there's a maximum here over the Arctic Ocean. Same thing for changes in precipitation. Well, now even the multimodal mean change is more complicated. There are changes of the Rhine sign. More precipitation in high latitudes, generally more precipitation in the tropics. But in wide areas and subtropics and low and mid latitudes, well, including the Mediterranean area, for example, less precipitation. Standard deviation is also quite noisy, but now the order of magnitude is similar to the order of the multimodal mean sex. So the agreement is not as good as it was before the But even here, the magnitude of the differences between the models, it varies between different areas. And in particular, one might note this minimum over the high and mid latitudes, especially over the southern ocean, but, but also here in the northern hemisphere, high and mid latitudes. So we actually are actually in an area where the differences in precipitation change between the models. Excuse me, uh, what do you mean this 30 year mean? Uh, how much is it impacted by some natural uh, variations in these climate signals like NAO? For example, I also the NAO can produce the changes in precipitation and maybe uh, it can be more frequent in the one period than in the other. Uh, okay, I can, I, I'm going to answer this, at least in the context of this model simulation. So, uh, it's a very silly question. Is it typically below zero up north? So, so does this uh, mean more rain or, or more snow? Okay, so... There is, there is... Uh, so, so, okay, so this is, this is the person change in annual precipitation. And generally speaking, almost every event this means, means more rain. Or one can say that, say, say that everywhere they, 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 they have an increase in total precipitation, there is more rain. And basically everywhere the fraction of solid precipitation is decreasing. So the amount of snowfall, well, it might increase but in some, somewhere, somewhere, some very cold areas in high latitudes. But for example, if we consider North, Northern Europe, it's very good. Probably. But the question is, uh, the, there, there is a great increase in the uh, up north. Yes. It's very much north. Does that mean that it's going to be more snow? I think, well, so probably when you go to the Arctic Ocean yeah. and Northern Siberian places like this, we, there will, will be slightly small snow, snow also. But in percent terms, the increase in snowfall is, is smaller than the increase in total rainfall, total, total precipitation. I have a question about that. Isn't that impossible to understand the difference between the So, so basically what is, where this difference comes from is of course this 
this increase in temperatures which converts some from the previous rain, rainfall to snowfall. Okay, so one way of putting these two variables on the same scale is just to measure the relative agreement with the relation between the mean and the standard deviation and one, one, as one would expect. And here the rule of the thumb interpretation is that if you now assume that these model results are more or less following a Gaussian distribution, then a ratio of one means that approximately five models out of six agree on the sign of the change when we get ratios of two or more in absolute value, so then can basically all models agree on the direction of the change, even if not of the magnitude. So, the agreement is better than for temperature than for precipitation. For temperature, the best agreement is not seen here over high latitudes, where the multimodal mean change is the largest, but rather here in the tropics, where the standard deviation is the smallest. For precipitation change, there are in fact five areas where the agreement with the model simulation, simulation is rather bad. But here over higher latitudes, there is a rather robust increase of precipitation in these simulations. Basically because, well, well this is because much of, the, much of the precipitation that we get here in high latitudes, it's transported by the atmosphere from lower latitudes. And when the atmosphere is becoming, becoming warmer, the moisture transport capacity is increasing, so we get a larger moisture advection from, from more than more southern latitudes, even if there is no, no change in the, in, in, in the wind conditions. So here we have a rather robust signal particle in over northern Eurasia. So this was for the end of the century. What happens if you make the same analysis from the beginning of the century, the first 30 years up to the year 2030, well, as one might expect, this, this relative agreement is now lower simply because the increase in greenhouse gas concentration is much smaller and therefore the common signal is weaker. And sometimes people interpret this as, as meaning that short-term climate changes are more uncertain than long-term long climate changes. But of course, this is only true when you consider this in in these relative units. Then you instead look directly at the standard deviation between the simulations. It's of course much larger in the end of the century when the modern difference play a rather larger role than in the beginning of the century. So here is one example, a particular location, my favorite location in southern Finland, very close to Helsinki. A diagram of unnormal temperature and precipitation changes to the end of the century, now separately for all these 51 simulations. So, in this case, the good news is that all these simulations actually are in the same quadrant. It really doesn't happen, happen everywhere in the, in the world. This is an exception rather than, than the rule. But still, there is a lot of variation between these different simulations. So, now the question is how much of this variability is, is caused genuinely by the fact that the models have different physics and dynamics and how much can be explained by different realizations of internal variability in the simulations. So here I have highlighted one of these initial condition ensembles, the NKR, CCS and free model which has seven simulations with the same posing but different initial conditions. So, there are some differences, particularly in precipitation change, but still, these differences are not large enough to span this, this whole variability within this 22 model or 51 simulation ensemble. So, the implication is that in internal variability is not at all sufficient to explain all differences in simulated climate change at that time. And in the following, I'll in making this more quantitative, so using systematically all these initial condition ensembles that are available within the semi-free data set, I estimate the variance explained by internal variability in these models 
and that they are having this estimate available, one can then estimate the two modal related variance as a residual by subtracting from this total variance, which is affected by both model differences and internal variability, the estimated contribution of internal variability. Of course, in practice, there is always, always some, something uncertain when making this kind of calculations. So what we get, first of all, for temperature changes in the late 21st century, so here is the actual standard deviation between the model simulations which includes the spoke of co contributions, more differences, and internal variability. And here is the estimate of what can be explained by internal variability alone. So there is in fact some similarity in the patterns, particularly one can notice fairly, uh, relatively large internal variability here in high latitudes, but still the numeric values are very different. And actually, these maps are understating this difference, what is really relevant are not the standard deviations, but the difference in variance. And globally average the variance of the actual variance of simulations is about 20 times larger than the contribution of internal variability. This really in, in, in implicates that a large majority of this, this variance here must be caused truly by more differences. That's what we'd expect really, isn't it? Because the 30 year averaging period is a pretty good period for temperature. Yes. Smoothing. Yes. Yeah. That's what we might expect. Okay. Same thing for precipitation changes again to the end of the century. Well, again, clearly, internal variety is too small to explain all of these differences. But nevertheless, this difference is not, not quite as large as it was for temperature. So again, in terms of the variances, about 20% of total differences can be explained by internal variability, which by implication leaves about something like 80% to model differences. So this is the end of the 21st century. What happens earlier? Temperature, first 30 years of the century, now, now the basic difference is that the actual variance between the model simulations is much smaller. Numeric values here is 0 0.10 degrees squared. Here I had 0 0.70, so it's only one part of, out of seven. By contrast, this variance caused by internal variability. Well, some people might imagine that I did must increase with time, but it doesn't happen in these semi-free simulations. Here we have 0 0.35. Here 0 0.35. And so it's, it's basically the same. So in this case, about 40% of the variance can be explained by internal variability and the rest, that is, rest is due to, to model differences. And of course, when we take Precipitation changes in the end, big, beginning of the century, the internal variability becomes even more important. So now these maps are quite similar in many areas and globally average about 70% of these differences already seem to be explained by internal variability. So model differences are not yet very important in this case. So here is a summary of this kind of a calculation. So now I have here three different 30-year periods in different parts of the century in addition to a single decade, 2011-2020, and in addition to annual mean changes that yes, was, were shown in these maps, seasonal and monthly mean climate changes. So there is quite a clear logic in these numbers. The numbers increase toward, towards the near-term future simply because at that time the total variance is smaller the model related differences are smaller and they also increase when you reduce the averaging period so there is a smaller sample of the inter internal variability and it's not averaged out as, as efficiently so it's larger for a single decade than a 30 year period centered at the same time and it's larger for seasonal means of climate change and monthly means of climate change than, than for annual means so generally for temperature it's internal variability that model differences are comparable for the next 30 years, but 
that thereafter model differences dominate, core precipitation, they are still comparable in the middle of this the sensory and before that internal variability dominates. So, of course, these are globally average numbers. If we look specifically at Northern Europe, this is what happens. No, of course, one thing that ha happens is that, that something uncertain in this calculation becomes larger, but nevertheless, there seems to be a systematic difference in the sense that in this particular area, internal variability is relatively more important. So, for temperatures, still clearly dominates during the first 30 years, and for precipitation, since it actually dominates even in the middle of this sensor. So, why does this happen? The explanation seems to be slightly different between temperature and precipitation. And we come back to these maps of internal variability. So, for temperature, the explanation is just the, just the fact that this internal variability in the models and, and most probably also in the reality increases very strongly from low to high latitudes. So, the internal variability is much, much about the average. But when you look at precipitation, it's different. In fact, in, in, even in terms of internal variability, the variability in Northern Europe is relatively small. So now the explanation lies in the fact that the actual differences in precipitation change in, in Northern Europe. Europe, uh, Europe uh, in, in relative, not in absolute terms, even smaller compared to the global average conditions that they are, are, are for internal variability. So, this was about part one. And here I have this part only considered one emission scenario, but what about these different scenarios? So, the numbers in this diagram, they are directly from the latest IPCC report, report what is shown is the projected change in global temperature separately for these six different emission scenarios from the around 1990 around to, to the last decade of this century. So for the lowest scenario from 1.1 to 2.9 degrees, for the highest scenario from 2.4 to 6.4 degrees, taking into account of the climate modeling uncertainty and the carbon cycle uncertainty that was actually not present in, in, in my previous comparison. So, there is slightly more, more, more than a factor of two difference between the lowest and highest scenario among this, among this set of scenarios. So, now what is more difficult is to make uh, this analysis on regional scales simply because not all of these scenarios have been simulated with, with this three-dimensional global climate models. So, for example, this semi-free data set, it only includes simulations for P1, A1, B, and A2 scenarios, and even for this subset of scenarios, they are not all available for all models. So, there is a subset of 50 models for which, which all of them, them are available. So, in any case, we can compare these scenarios with each other. So here I'm comparing the 50 model mean warming to the end of the century between A2 and A1B and between B1 and A1B. And of course, in a qualitative sense, the results are just as expected. A2 scenario has higher greenhouse gas emissions, higher greenhouse gas concentrations, and therefore larger warming in the end of the century. B1 scenario has lower greenhouse gas emissions, lower greenhouse gas concentrations, and therefore smaller warming in the end of the century. And particularly for the B1 scenario, these differences are not negligible. Actually, here over, over the Arctic Ocean, the largest differences are of the order two, of two, 2 degrees centigrade. But nevertheless, one needs to relate the magnitude of these differences with the differences that one, that one actually gets when comparing simulations maybe different models, but, but under the same emission scale. You can see from that picture why patent scaling is considered to be a very good approximation function, because yes. basically it's the same picture. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. 
if so, there are people who always insist that you have to take, have to make these simulations for all different scenarios, but mm. of course it's a waste of resources. Mm. Okay, so to the answer to this question is, of course, logically obtained by normalizing these interscenario differences by these intermodal differences for a one So now, of course, it depends on where you are. These ratios tend to be higher here in low latitudes, where the differences between model simulations on the same scenario are, are smaller. But nevertheless, the general picture for this period in the end of this century is that these ratios vary on both sides of plus one, plus one and the minus one. So one can probably say that in the late 21st century, these differences between skin areas and differences between climate models are more or less as important. So in the following, I'll take this B1 skin area because it's further away from my A1B comparison and look at the first previous 30 periods in the beginning of the century and in the middle of the century. Well, in the middle of the century, this difference is already beginning to become significant, particularly here over lower latitudes where the ratio actually is, is lower than minus minus one. But for the next 30 years or the, for the, the still still these differences between the skin areas are, are basically negligible. So it's less the ratio is less than one uh, than, than one half in, in most part of the world. And this was all for changes in temperature. What happens with changes in precipitation? Well, for precipitation changes, the relative agreement between the model simulations goes lower, and therefore the relative importance of the scenario differences when compared with the in the model differences is smaller. So even in the late of the late, late 21st century, in most parts of the world, these intermodal differences actually dominate over the differences between the emission scenarios for precipitation change. Well, there are some exceptions, like I'd say Northern Eurasia, where actually the increase in precipitation is so robust and scales with the magnitude of the forcing that there is some, some significant difference between this, this, this B1 and A1, this scenarios. But, but still, still, this is mostly not the case. So again, if we take a local illustration, this is for the same grid box, three thirty periods, temperature changes and precipitation changes, P1 scenario, and the blue dots, A1, B1, with black dots, A2 with red dots. First 30 years, basically no separation between the scenarios. Next 30 years, some slight separation particularly for the B1 scenario, the changes tend to be slightly smaller than they are for the A1, B and A2 scenarios. And a much more clear separation during the end, in the end of the century. So smallest changes for B1, largest changes for A2. But nevertheless, the difference between the models are also growing larger. So there is still a large deal of overlap between these different scenarios at least here in Northern Europe. In some areas, that in, in the tropics, where the difference between the models are smaller, this separation, at least in temperature changes, would become, become more clear. So, as one might expect, this uncertainty due to emission scenario differences, it increases quite strongly with time, and now depending on what you consider, the variable geographic area, scale, and so on, it may or may not become more important than this difference between climate models by the end of the century. The uncertainty seems to be small in the short run. This is, of course, pretty much dictated by the fact that these scenarios, even in terms of the emissions, diverge relatively slowly from each other. But in principle, there is a caveat in this conclusion. None of these scenarios includes any really rapid changes in the emissions. And for example, if, uh, if there would be 
graphic changes in the emissions of some, some aerosol species, black carbon or, 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 or some, something else due to environmental reasons. This might affect the climate more rapidly than these scenarios are actually able to describe. So it is not necessarily a final conclusion. So then we come to the part three, which is slightly different. Here I've been asking what is meant with present climate. And with present, I mean now around the year 2011, not for example 1971, 2000, or 1961, 1990, or any other, other so called normal period that is typically used for describing the observed climate. Climate, on the other hand, is usually taken to mean the statistics of weather over a long enough period, and long enough means at least 30 years. So the present climate is in some sense a paradoxical con concept because it, it really cannot be observed directly, or we will observe our present climate sometime around 2025 or something, something according to this, this definition. So, why to study a question like this? There is one motivation. Last year in Helsinki and in Southern Finland in general, January was quite cold, with a mean temperature of minus 10.4 degrees, which is cold even in, in by Finnish standards. And many people actually perceive this month as exceptionally cold. Well, when you look at the actual time series from the beginning of the century, this was not really exceptional compared with the earlier variations. There have been many, many colder Januarys before. But nevertheless, when we have this global warming going on, there is the question if, if these past observations are re representative of the variations that we can expect today, or if the global climate change is already having some, some impact on the probability of this cold or, or, or mild, mild winters. So in the following, I'll try to add this using a technique that was documented in Climate Dynamics three years ago. So here is the idea is to try to estimate the present day climate under the background of global warming by combination of observations and model simulations. So first we make this simple so-called pattern scale assumption that the local climate, for example in Helsinki, depends linearly on the global mean temperature. Actually I'm using a slightly smooth evolution of global mean temperature. So so I, I built the out, 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 out the short term in the annual variations. So for each one degree of global mean warming, the global global ten, mean temperature is assumed to increase by 8 degrees centigrade, and the inter-annual temperature variability is assumed to change by 3% for one degree of global warming. So now in principle, one might imagine estimating this regression coefficients directly from observations, but in practice this is not a very good idea. The signal to noise ratio would still be very low. So therefore I'm again reverting to this semi-free ensemble of model simulations. For each of these models there are almost 200 years of data. They include a much larger range of global mean temperature change than observations do, and there are over, over 20, 20 models available. And finally, this regression coefficients from the models together with the observed global mean temperature change are used to adjust past observations in order to make them more representative of, of the climatic conditions that we can, can expect in present, present day climate. So, here's an example of this. Can you go back to the last point? Yes. Would it, do you want to say that the past observations impose what the current state is, not that you adjust the previous observations to adjust for what you expect. So could you speak more about item 3, because it seems to be a... Well, I'm not sure. Perhaps there's some kind of a cultural shock because I didn't, didn't understand your question. 
Okay, but I... We can speak about it later. Yes. So, what kind of... Um, you could talk about what kind of regression model you fitted here on the scene of three. Okay, so what I have fitted here, okay, so... There are some, 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 some dirty equations, but... Okay, I'm doing this for... I'm doing this for each model individually. In the individually, well, the predictor is basically, I think it was something like simply the 11 year running year of the global mean temperature or something. Mm -hmm. And I first make a regression between the local mean temperature, uh, uh, local mean temperature and, this, the, 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 and the global mean temperature. And after this, I have this regression line, I do another regression for the differences or the residuals between this mean temperature curve and, and, and the actually, actually simulated temperatures. Or, 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 or probably I, I measured, the, measured the variation by the absolute value of these residuals. Mm -hmm. And then this absolute value of the residuals is regress, again regressed against the global mean temperature. Mm -hmm. So that's your attempt to correct for what correlation in the residual structure for the time series regression. Because the internal variability of the model will have a strong AR, strong red noise characteristic, which will mean that regression coefficients would be unbiased, but not minimum variance. Well, I'm Again, I'm not quite sure. So, in principle, if there is, so uh, yes, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. So, so in principle, if the residuals have, have this red noise, no noise character, char char character, I, 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 I don't care about it. Mm -hmm. So, it may may affect this calculation, but I, I don't I also don't directly see how how this should bias bias this the estimation in this case. Right, so that would be a, what we call that would be a statistical bias. It would be the fact that the estimate does not have an expectation under re replication which was equal to the coefficient which we were trying to estimate. Okay, that's all that's possible, but that's the best. Best that I could do. Okay, so that what is what we get for this coefficient January mean temperature average over all these 22 models. Mean temperature is for one degree of global warming. We have particularly in winter this maximum in high latitudes. So just if you pick up the location of Helsinki here, we have a value of slightly over two degrees per centigrade per one degree of global warming. And then we have a decrease in internal variability generally in high latitudes. It's not very large, but the average by about six percent uh, per one degree of global warming. And and, and unlike with this, with this mean warming, with this, of course, at least of the same sign in the different models, this changing the variability actually is in, inconsistent in sign between different simulations. But what turns out in practice is that for the results that we get here, this mean change is much more important than the change in variability. So this uncertainty is not as serious that it might, might seem. So this 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 illustrates this idea of correcting or adjusting this past observation. So to so to take away the effects of of this global mean temperature change, the blue line is the January temperatures that we actually have observed, and the red line is the so to say the best estimate of the temperatures that would have been observed if the weather conditions otherwise had been similar, but the global mean temperature had always been on the level there it's now. So here at the end of the time series, the two lines come on the top of each other. Here in the beginning, the global mean temperature was still something like 0 0.8 degrees below the present day level. So there is a, light, a large adjustment to, his, to these observed temperatures. So, 
Now, when we have these two time series available, then one can treat them basically in the same way. So, for example, you may, using some suitable form of smoothing, one can try to estimate continuous probability distributions, and here is what we get. The blue line is from observations, 1901 to 2005 in this case, and the red line is the test estimate from the present data, January temperature line. So, we have this shift for higher temperatures as a result of, of making this adjustment. So, how one does one in interpret, interpret this kind of diagrams when, when one needs to calculate probabilities? Well, it's a simple matter of calculating areas. How frequently one could shoot one exit minus 10.4 degrees or lower? Just take the area to the left of this line for the observed distribution about 7 or 8 percent in blood return period of about 13 years for the estimated present day distribution of the order of 5 percent or once in 20 years. So there is an effect from the global climate sense, but it still is not very large compared with this large internal variability. So even for the present day climatic conditions, the last January was not really exceptional. So January was cold, but it was not the only interesting month last year. July was warm. So this massive heat wave that there was in northwestern Russia it also affected southern and eastern Finland. In Helsinki we had the all time record, 31.7 degrees in the July mean temperature. So again, one can, one, 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 one can speculate how rare an event, event this actually was. So according to the observational report directly, it seems like a very unusual event. But when one makes the same adjustment, again, based on the smaller simulations, the picture is somewhat different. So in this best estimate adjusted time series, there are actually some earlier July months that now have a high temperature. So again, in terms of in terms of probabilities, distributions, that is what we get. Directly from past observations, it's actually a difficult matter to estimate this probability of exceeding the value last year. Last year it is it's quite sensitive to the method of move, making this curve between but this method gives an order of 0 0.3 to 3 percent of France in 3 centuries. For the present day climate, even though this absolute shift in temperature is actually smaller, that is in the winter, but so is also the, in the, in the annual variability, so this small shift does have a noticeable impact on this probability. But still the return period seems to be of the order of 60 years, so it's not yet an ordinary July but not as exceptional as this past observations would suggest. So here I have used in a traditional way return periods to describe how common or how, how unusual these different temperatures are. But of course, in a non-stationary climate, this whole concept of return period is a little bit questionable because greenhouse gases are going to continue to increase it's all likely that the global warming will continue and with a reasonably high likelihood it will lead to a warming of global climate here in, here in Finland as well. So, there are best estimates that you ob 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 obtain when you extrapolate the evolution of the global mean temperature based on these A1B scenario simulations. So now there are two additional distributions for the years 2030 and 2050. And of course these curves are, the distributions are shifting further towards higher temperatures in both January and July. And this affects the probabilities. According to this calculation, which is based on the, on the average of this model results, and of course there is uncertainty around, around these values the probability of obtaining January as cold or colder than last year 
put on a bit of the order of one and a half percent in the middle of this century, if it's five percent now. And on the other hand, July is like the one that was observed last year. Would be, become four or five times more common by the middle of this century. So repeating almost once, one, once per decade on average. Assuming that climate change follows the current, current best estimates. So, three main points from this part are, first of all, that uncertainty climate change projections increases with time, at least in absolute, absolute terms. Uncertainty is initially dominated by natural variability, but modeling uncertainty and scenario uncertainty grow with time and become generally dominant towards the end of the century. And finally, present temperature climate cannot be estimated very well from past observations at all. So this all has been a relatively straightforward analysis of modern simulations, but of course there are also remaining important remaining open questions in this field. And I listed here three of them. First of all, here I basically assume that internal variability is unpredictable, but in principle, if you use initial condition in information, you perhaps might predict some part of the internal variability, at least for the near future, which would make the uncertainty somewhat smaller. But is this actually practical the case? Second, can uncertainty be here, here I assume that all these models give equally plausible results, results but one can also ask, could this uncertainty be reduced by eliminating or downwriting models that seem to be behaving badly in the simulation of observed climate? And finally, we have this question how well do these presently available in samples cover the real modeling uncertainty? So, as I said, these are open questions, but I nevertheless give my own questions. So, can uncertainty be reduced by predicting internal variability? Well, to some extent the answer is probably yes, at least potentially so. There are several studies in literature that show that some large-scale aspects of the climate and, for example, the Atlantic Ocean circulation should be predictable for a limited period of time to occur of the order of decade or so. However, even of the, if this large scale aspect of, are predictable, and even if the ocean circulation is predictable, we still have the problem that these aspects do not directly matter very much for ordinary people. So what matters for people are the local climate conditions over where they, where they live, that is land areas. And all these modern simulations, or all, all these studies that I have seen, in practice seem to search is that even the potential predictability of this interdecadal variability over land areas in practice in practice quite modest. So I, I wouldn't be very optimistic about reducing the uncertainty to, by using initial condition information. Second, can uncertainty be reduced by eliminating or downwriting models that seem to behave badly? Then again, in specific cases, the answer is yes. There are really are cases where you see a strange climate change projection for a particular model and know that this near must be associated with a bad simulation of the observed climate. This is perhaps the best example that I can find. This is from the semi free data set one particular Chinese model, the first map shows the winter mean temperature as simulated in the end of the 20th century, the second map shows the change in winter mean temperature to the end of the 21st century. So we get a huge warming of the uh, up to order of 14 degrees here over the mid latitude northern Atlantic, but when you look more closely, this warming is of course happening because the ice cover with this model simulating here is happens to have an ice age basically basically over, 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 over this, this part of the board when the ice, ice cover is melting. And of course this is totally unrealistic and won't happen 
uh, again, these are real work. But what te 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 you did, the idea of using anomalies is meant to correct for this. It's a joke, of course, it doesn't correct for this at all, but you know, all the scenic results are done in terms of anomalies. And the idea is that the anomalies are linear all the way through yes. changes of phase, which is crazy. You know? so yes, this yes. is a good example of that. This is a good example of that. But unfortunately, this is a, this is a rather rare example. Mm -hmm. In the sense that in, it, it's very, very actually it's very difficult to generalize this. So what would one, what one would hope for is of course to say develop some kind of an objective and general writing scene that would would, would always and everywhere downright the models that are, that are not likely to give give useful climate change predictions. But in practice, this is extremely difficult because. Well, climate models, sorry, this was brought off the wrong color. Climate models are, are big black boxes and <laughs> what we basically see from this, we see, we see that it's a simulation of present climate. The simul the simulation of future climate changes, but we don't generally have a very good idea of the co connection between these two. So how is the skill in simulation of present climate related to the skill of simulating climate changes? So for these reasons, I'm not only also very optimistic about, about finding a good general solution mm -hmm. to this problem. Yes. Um, and also, I think something very important there is that maybe some, if we look at a model in a global, you know, in global mean temperature, and it looks like a bad model, maybe it's going to do well locally. And there is no relationship, or there is very little, you know, to find a relationship on how well models do locally. Yes. And, and then, if you want to downscale to, to what the scales are now. Mm. Yeah. I mean, you could argue that the Chinese models have been specially tuned to get the climate over China about right, and therefore their performance in the North Atlantic wouldn't actually be particularly important to the purposes for which they were constructed. That's right. Yeah. yeah. But I'm not, not yeah, sure, 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 sure about, but actually this particular model, when you look at this perp of mass for it works for example, uh, in the tropics in, 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 by some measures, not all measures. Yeah, no, it's it's actually in the middle of the distribution, so it's, yeah. it's not that easy. Then this last question was how well do this present available in samples cover the real modeling uncertainty? So this is of course something that remains to be seen, but most probably one can say that they, they cannot cover all the modeling uncertainty simply because well, they, they are not completely independent and, and these in samples by construction actually exclude some sources of uncertainty, like the carbon cycle in the same free comparison. But another conclusion that's probably pretty safe is that this will depend on which aspect of climate is considered. So for example, myself, I have a, a more confidence in that these ensembles capture a large part of the uncertainty in temperature change than in precipitation change. And this is because precipitation change is much more sensitive to the details of this aerosol forcing that is, that is rather badly and unsystematically treated in this, this present model simulation. So, this was all. Thank you. Questions, please. No. So, can you go back one slide, Unit, to your point B? This, this issue of can uncertainty be reduced, we have to be careful here. Of course, we, we haven't quantified uncertainty at all in any effective manner, so to talk about reducing it before we've actually quantified it is a bit, um, is a bit ambitious. I would actually take the opposite line to you. If you look at the CMIP-3 ensemble, there are many duplicates, effectively. I mean, large groups like NCAR and the Met Office have submitted multiple versions of effectively the same model, um, or a model which share large chunks of code. So treating the models as though they're all equally informative in the sense that you can actually take an, uh, an ensemble mean or an ensemble variance actually 
actually reduces uncertainty artificially because it counts two models that are effectively the same as though they were in fact different. And one of the key things that we have to do when we look at the CMIP3 and the CMIP5 ensemble when it comes online is we have to understand that if we want to understand what's going on in the ensemble, we have to not only remove models that are clearly not as good as the, base, as the benchmark model in the ensemble, but we also have to re re remove duplicate models which otherwise give that, that particular modeling group undue um, weight in the, in the ensemble average. Yeah. And the key concept here is to understand that what's underlying the idea that we can treat the ensemble in some kind of aggregate fashion is the notion that the ensemble members are, are exchangeable with each other. That's the mathematical or statistical term. And exchangeability means both that, that you know, bad models and duplicate models should be removed before the processing is done. So I think, actually, if you remove the duplicate models, it's quite possible that the uncertainty would go up rather than down. And that would be realistic. That's what you actually want yeah, to happen. Yeah, yeah. But then we have the question, how many independent models do we have? So that, and that's a question that we can't answer. It's yes, that's, a, that's, that's, that's a question also we can't can, can answer. It, 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 it's not 20. Hmm. It's larger than one. Or it's more on, uh, is it larger or smaller than two? So in, in our own work, we've taken the view that we would take the benchmark model from each modeling group on the basis that within a modeling yes, group yes. There is lots of com there's lots of continuity across modeling yes. phases. So one modeling group, one model, it seems to be the simplest thing that you can do that doesn't cause people to get upset. And then you set yourself a benchmark model in terms of resolution yeah. and resolve yeah. processes. Yeah, 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 but even uh, between these benchmark more models, there are in practice, in practice, uh, in practice uh, Shared components. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, 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 the Nemo ocean, ocean is used in about half of all the models. Yeah. Yeah. And the and the sea ice sea ice model is used in about half of the models. Yes. And the Oasis coupler is used in ninety five percent of the models. There's no doubt. What is the calibration effect that if you make a new model and you have to make sure that it works, you 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 debug it until it does basically what it is expected to do, which is what the other models say. How, how, how big is that effect? That's a very good question. Because the problem is that, well, uh, basically, each modeling group is usually trying to make the best model that they can. And it uh, uh, belongs to this uh, definition of the best model that it shouldn't be very far from others. Okay. So there's a lot of anecdotal evidence of models that, that were the best model that the group could produce coming up with numbers that didn't look like the numbers that the other models were producing yeah. and then the, that model was being effectively detuned to make it more like the other models rather than more realistic. Yeah. 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 That's what happens to sheep. Yeah. question. I, I didn't understand exactly. Uh, for example, do we have this uh, minimum maximum temperature? This corresponds to certain uh, Rather than some mean increase or, or decrease of temperature uh, on the global scale or European scale, it depends on the weather situation in certain months. Yes. And maybe this uh, change of climate is more the change of the frequency of certain weather situations than the change of some mean temperature, which is the background which then changes. That's how I see it. I don't know. Okay. Yes. That's a, that's a good question. What, what is exactly happening? But what I basically am assuming in this regression method is that, well, when we have a change in climate, so the, if we have the observed temperature distribution here somewhere, so I'm assuming that the location of this distribution may change the width of the distribution may change, increase or decrease, but I'm not trying to take into account any, any possible changes in the, in the shape of this distribution. Basically, so my, my general experience of these model simulations is that you really cannot go beyond, beyond the second moment, and even the second moment is sometimes a bit questionable. If I can say one comment, uh, maybe this 30 years, but my opinion is a, a bit short to make a, a, a good independent.
than the statistics because you can have this, this natural, for example, NEO has more or less changes sign of 10 years or so, so you get three times that. So you can easily pick up positive or negative inside the 30 years period. And that can change quite a lot the result for Europe. Yeah, yes, it, yes it can, but of course the 30 years is a compromise. Mm -hmm. Yes. Traditionally, yes. 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 it has been a compromise about available of homogeneous observations. Now it's also a compromise because, in any case, so it's usually people are not using techniques like this. They are just using the observations to describe, describe the present day climate and will, will, will become biased if it's too long. Yeah. It's what they pay for large scale um, temperature, yes. right, for which the decorrelation is. So we're doing a parameter experiment where we've had to compromise on 20 years, and you know that is way too short. There's no doubt. Yes. Yeah, at, at the regional scale, it's too short. Yeah. But what can you do? These models are expensive. Friday would be perhaps then after the uh, Kiel, Keeling lecture. Keeling has a lecture in the Ola Magna. Uh, by the way, so you all know that the, where the Ola Magna is? That's at the, the university campus, main campus. Mm -hmm. And that takes um, some 20 minutes walk, maybe 25 minutes. But uh, there was this email that one should have announced, uh, should, one should have signed up by actually tomorrow, today. Uh, I did sign up myself, and I didn't. And I asked them whether we should sign up for others from our group, and I didn't get a response to that. So I'm not sure. I mean, the the auditorium is fairly big, of course. It's kind of have more than a thousand people, maybe two thousand actually. So it's a fairly big room, but. Uh, there is a link. Um, so if you. Yes, there's a link which I can email you. I have it on some. You ready to do that? Right, then I'll do that. Thank you.